good morning everyone and we want to welcome those that are joining us online this morning as well we're going to start our time of worship together and we want to invite you to stand this morning we're going to worship with a new song but before we do that i wanted to read from psalm 103 it's a psalm of david and it says let all that i am praise the lord with my whole heart, I will praise His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Our Lord gives us reason after reason to praise His name. He fills us with joy. He gives us hope. He gives us a promise of eternal life and so much more. So this morning, we're going to join our voices and proclaim those truths as one body. So let's do that together. Yeah. 
glory floods the earth and fills the skies. Oh, mighty God, there's no one like you. This is your heart to chase after us. So this morning, as one body, we confess our need for you. 
God, we need you. We want to be more like you. So continue to mold us, to change us, to shape us like potter with clay, to be more and more like you so that we can go into this world and shine your light. Jesus, thank you for the hope and joy that you bring. Thank you for the promise of eternity with you. So God, as we stand here and we ask for you to soften our hearts as you continue to speak to us so that when we leave, we don't leave the same, but we leave changed because we have seen more glimpse of who you are. So work in us and through us. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue in a spirit of worship and let's continue to make this place the most welcoming place we go all week. And one of the ways we do that is by turning around and saying hello to the brothers and sisters on your right and on your left. So let's do that now, and then you may be seated. Yeah, we should applaud that. Yep, 85. Awesome. That's on top of the 45 that so far have been baptized this year. So right now, I mean, that's a great indication as to the fact that there's a lot of remarkable things going on around this place. And uh, we can thank the Lord for that is what we can do. Life change is what it's all about. Hey, we're, uh, we're so thankful you're here with us uh, downstairs, upstairs, online as well. We're going to take an offering here in just a moment. And uh, if you're looking for ways in which you can give in a few moments down here as well as upstairs, they'll be passing the buckets. Uh, certainly, you can look on the side here and see that you can text and other ways in which you can give as well. Why do we do it? Why do we give around here on a, on a, on a given weekend? And, and uh, really, there's really three reasons. One is that it's through obedience. I mean, God makes it very clear in his word that we are to give a percentage of what God has given to us. And uh, we find that actually in the book of Malachi where he talks about just giving one to every ten pennies, or one to every, you know, a dime to every dollar, or a dollar to every ten, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is one way in which we demonstrate obedience to God. The other is that it connects us together, connects us together in really continuing to, to keep the mission of the, of the local church moving, or, or those local God-centered, gospel-centered organizations. And just like what we get to see here, we get to be connected to that, knowing that the ministries around here are helping to to, to bring people along. And, and certainly, as it relates to that, it continues to give you a vision and an understanding, a reminder. Every time I give, I'm reminded of where it came from and that all I've been given has been given by God. And uh, so that's why we give around here at Pathway. And somebody asked those who are going to serve us this time, go ahead and come on down, and they're going to begin to pass the buckets and make sure they make their way all the way down to the end of the aisle. Uh, this weekend is what we call Connect Sunday, and, uh, and Connect Sunday is an opportunity for you to actually connect within a, within a life group. One way in which we grow is certainly in our rows, but another way in which we grow is through the relationships that we develop with others in a more intimate relationship through small groups or what we call life groups around here. And, uh, and so this morning as you leave, as you head out to the lobby, go ahead and start passing. As you head out to the lobby, you'll be some, see some folks with some t-shirts on. Matter of fact, do we have any life group leaders in here that can just stand real quick? Just stand real quick. Show them your t-shirts. So there they are. They're all right here. And uh, they're going to be out in the lobby area, and they're going to be helping you find an open life group if you're not in a life group. And if there's no lo open life groups, which they're listed in the bulleted, uh, they're actually going to begin, begin to, to develop a new life group launch, which will be happening, and that's also in the bulletin too, 
where you can come together for four weeks and you're going to meet other people that are part of launching a new life group and a new life group is going to be formed out of that. And last year we did this and it was really, really tremendously successful, meaningful. Uh, Most of the folks that went through that last year are still in their life groups. And the reason we want you to do that is because we're going to begin to move into a new series after this series uh, called Beneath the Surface. We're going to be talking about really what are those areas in our life that we need to let the Spirit of God really do some deep work in our life. And we're going to walk through that on a Sunday morning, and then you're going to process that within the context of your life groups. And I think it's going to be incredibly transformational for us as a church as well. But this morning, uh, we're going to begin a new series called Indelible. And as I was thinking about this series, we really, it's going to feel a little bit insider to a degree. Uh, We're going to talk about, you know, what does it mean to make not simply a lasting mark, but a forever mark in the life of someone else. We're going to talk about what it means to make a lasting mark, forever mark, in your home. What does it mean to, to make a forever mark in your work? What does it mean to make a forever mark in this church? And certainly, not only in this church, but what are we doing in our city? And how are we connecting with other ministries, even in our city, to make a forever mark in our city for the cause of Christ? And what about in our world? And so this morning, we're talking about the home. And, uh, and I've asked Mark Holman to come, and Mark runs an organization called, called Faith at Home, and, and actually many of the things we do around here are really centered around the fact that we want to help you live out your faith at home, whether it be the God times in here uh, on every given week where you can actually sit down in your home and, and take your Bible and open it up and really reflect on what's happened the week before within the message, whether if you're in Kids City, those little take-home sheets that you can sit down with your kids and, and work through that in your home with your children. Uh, you know, whether, whether it be within youth ministry, where the same thing happens in student ministries, we want to make certain that we are driving you back to your home and understand the home is a primary place of discipleship. And so Mark's going to talk to us about why that is so important for us. Let me tell you why I think it's important. When we, look, when we walk through Scripture, we get in the book of Deuteronomy, when the people of Israel are making their way out of, out of Egypt and the Promised Land. Moses is given an instruction. He instructs the people of Israel, listen, whatever you do, Never stop talking about God's faithfulness. Never stop talking about God's character to your kids. Make sure that you're reminding them of what he has done for us. And then when they get to the promised land, Joshua, who leads them in the promised land, when he's an old man, about ready to die, he stands before the people and says, you've got to make a decision. The decision is this. Are you going to follow the gods of culture, or are you going to follow the one true God? And he says, for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make his word and his truth the foundation of our home. And then Jesus in Matthew 7 tells those folks that are standing on the side of a hill, sitting on the side of a hill listening to, those, to a very long teaching. And at the end of the teaching, he says, okay, now you've got to make a decision. How are you going to build? What's the foundation of your life going to be built on? Is it going to be built on the world, on culture, on the sand? Or is it going to be built on the truth of God's word, the truth of who God is, the truth of his character? And, uh, and what is it going to be? Because one is going to be sand, one is going to be, one is going to be rock. One is going to be solid. One is going to be shifting. And he said, the reason why you need to make sure that you understand that is because it's not if the storms come, it's when the storms come. It's going to be, it's going to determine what your house is built upon, what your life is built upon, what your home is built upon. And so that's why this morning is so important. And uh, and Mark's going to do a great job leading us through it. Before he comes, uh, we're going to just listen and participate in this song. Let's stand together, shall we? And just to reinforce that understanding of the foundation that we have in Christ and Christ alone. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never Sense. 
you guys can have a seat. I was determined to raise my children in a happy home, and I think the home should be your sanctuary. And there were just things, arguing, and things that just, there was no peace. And the thing that kept me from doing that was fear of raising four kids on my own. But I decided I'm just gonna trust God. And so I made that decision. So at the time we moved here, Sydney was two, Jordan was four, Devon was nine, Tasha was 19. What we found is I wanted my kids to have a solid foundation because there is so much division in the world. I read, a house divided cannot stand. So I had to have a solid foundation. And if at least we all believed in the same thing, that would help. So in order for them to capture my what I was saying, they had to have their own relationship with God. And that came from reading to them at night, Bible study with them during the day. And as a single mom, you don't have a lot of time. So the only way I can get my Bible study in is if I did it with them. And so what would happen over the years, I find out things they would see me do, they would do. My son Devin said, I learned more from watching what you did than what you said. It's really simple, mm -hmm. if you really think about it. It's like from a very early age, we were raised watching teachers, listening to the word, but then mm -hmm. the difference was we would see it work in our day-to-day -day oh, lives. Absolutely. So it was like, okay, this isn't just something somebody else is telling us, like I'm seeing his work, right? What do you do after church as a Bridges family? Every single one of them are gonna say, we sit at the kitchen table and we talk about the service. and. You know, as kids, you get antsy and you're ready for service to get out and you just want to go play with toys or play the Xbox or something. But my mom would always, either in the car or when we got back, she would say, hey, let's all sit at the table and talk about what we got out of church. As an adult, we recognize the value of that because what she was doing is she was taking what happened in church, right, and bringing it back to the home. Like when mm. we were little, there was like, mm. you couldn't listen to this music and you couldn't watch this. And like, even if you go upstairs right now, there's towers of VHSs of Christian cartoons and, and coloring books. And I'm like, oh, again, we're on a road trip. And so it's like, pull out, pull out the Bible. And so it's like, why did you do that? Mm. But now that I'm like almost 40 and I have a 14 year old, it's like, no, I get it. I get it now that I'm a parent. There are plenty of mornings in my head where I'm like, where's my mom? And I go in and I see her sitting in her, her blue love seat, just her with her, her journal. And when I was young, I didn't know what she was writing. And as I grew up, she would say, hey, I'm praying. I'm doing my prayer time. I'm in my quiet time. I, I truly believe in the power of prayer. I truly believe in finding scriptures in the Bible to stand on those prayers that you're asking. Pray God's word back to him to pray without ceasing. The things that grew my faith was when I've prayed for my kids and they may not have known and I've seen them, the prayers answered. That Bible, she's had that Bible for so long, it doesn't even have a cover anymore, but it still has the same truths in there. You know, that Bible's been through as much life as my mom has and it's still there and she still uses it. As I'm stepping more and more into my my faith life and I have a family now with Haley, like those are rhythms that I'm gonna be looking to establish because I've seen it before. We lived here for five months and my only sibling died in a car accident. I was a mess. I wouldn't get out of bed. Sydney was two and Jordan was four and she came to the bed and she said, Mommy, I know you're sad, but we miss our friends at church. Could you please take us to church so we can play with our friends? My mom's gonna get out of bed to do for her kids. And later on that showed me, I wonder, what if I had not been taken in the church? You know, how would I be? So I forced myself to go to church because they wanted to go to church. You know, just looking at the sheer reality of our circumstances, a single parent, 
with three kids in the house and also helping out with the half siblings, the odds were stacked against us to not be a successful family. You know, to be a single woman doing this, you can't do it without God. There is just simply no way possible. And to watch my mom through faith raise all of us has shown me as, as well as the rest of my siblings the importance of following God's voice even when it doesn't seem like it makes sense. I believe that you can do it. Don't let down your your, your morals or God's word. Don't trade that. Know God's word. Know what you can stand on. Share those words with your children. Study God's word with your children. Help your kids understand what a relationship with Christ is. Not what a Christian is, but what a relationship is with Christ. Well, good morning, Pathway. Good morning. It's great to be back with you guys. And boy, I couldn't have asked for a better setup than both a song and the video. And I tell you what, what Ron already shared, I don't even know if we need a message at this point. You pretty much already get it. You know, this is, and, and I don't know, it's been about four or five years since I've been here. And the one thing I've come to the reality is, is that, you know what changes over five years? You get older. How many here don't like getting older? And then you have to face that reality, like you go to the closet, like, okay, I'm going to that really cool pathway to hang out with all those cool people, and what do I got in here that's going to make me look young? Absolutely nothing. That isn't going to work. And then it's like, okay, I want to, I want to be able to really connect and, and relate, and oh boy. But, and, and, and in the last, since I've been here, while well, I happened just this last year, I, I hit the speed limit in age. No, not 60 or 65, stop it. But I hit the speed limit of 55. And you know what happens when you hit 55? You get ARP, A-A-R-P, you get all this. So I signed up for ARP, and I signed my wife up for it too. She wasn't happy that I signed her up for it. Husbands don't do that, because she's younger than me, and she was not super thrilled. But friends, as you get older, you start to ask yourself now, okay, I'm looking at the next 10 years. I'm pastoring a great church in Minnesota and continuing to direct Faith at Home Ministries. What is the mark we want to leave now? And even through the pandemic, we had a chance to just kind of reflect and maybe reset a little bit and go we take a look back at what we had been doing and now say, what do we want to do moving forward? What is the mark that we are really trying to leave and then Ron reaches out to me and he says, hey, I'd like you to do to start this series called Indelible. And I was like, that's like right where I'm at. I've been spending the last year trying to look at, okay, what now is going to be for the next 10 years? What's going to be the focus? What's going to be the mark that we're going to leave? Stephen Covey, of course, has that leadership principle, start with the end in mind. What is our end goal? What is the mark that we want to leave? And I had a chance to speak to one of my mentors during, I had a sabbatical when I was really spending some time trying to take a look at, okay, what, what's that going to be then? And I had a chance to meet with one of my mentors and one of my friends, and I'm really blessed. His name is George Barna. He is the nation's leading Christian researcher. Has been for over 40 years. He's the most quoted man Christian in America. Because everyone quotes Barna statistics, Barna says, Barna this. There is not a thing that Barna has not researched. He has been researching the Christian church for this 40 years. He has been looking under the hood. He's been making us aware of things, whether we wanted to know it or not. He has had a passion to kind of help the church, point out things to the church. This is what's happening to Christianity in America. And a lot of times, his statistics and his data, we haven't liked looking at. Because it doesn't, it's not always pretty. But he knows it's important and we have to be aware of these things. And he loves the church. And so when I had a chance, I had a chance to interview him. And because George is going through that same thing where right now he is looking at kind of the last few years of his, his career. And so he had lots of options as to what he could focus on. And I would like you to listen. This is the nation's, I mean, of all the things that he could have focused on to finish his career, what is the one thing that he thinks, where, what is the indelible mark that he wants to leave on Christianity in America? Let's, let's listen to what he has to say. A couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I looked at the trajectory of my life, realized I'm getting older. 
I've only got a limited time left, certainly fewer years in front of me than behind me. And uh, biblically, I think we're called to finish well. So I wanted to figure out what would that look like for me. So I went back and reevaluated about the last 200 or so national research studies I'd conducted and made notes, had a little notebook, and I kept writing down, what did I learn from this study? What did I learn from that study? And at the end of that process, tallied it all up. And what became very clear was that the major problems that we're facing in our country and our personal lives, no matter what you look at, all come back to worldview. So if we want to solve America's problems, the church's problems, family problems, personal problems, the solution always comes back to worldview. And as I looked at how much research and emphasis is placed upon that particular element, I found that, you know what, it's pretty well ignored in our country. And so I thought, well, maybe the best thing that I can offer to the church would be to try to get us back on track so that we really are thinking about what does biblical worldview mean? How do we get one? How do we live it? How do we share it? The important things so that ultimately the church can be the church that Jesus died for. And if we don't have a biblical worldview, much like we see in America today, we will not be that church. Ooh, that kind of, I was like, don't hold back, George. You could tell he wasn't. But then I pressed him a little further. Would you please now then explain to us what is a biblical worldview? Let's listen a little more. To answer the question, what is a worldview? Sure. And I, I want people to understand that everybody has one. It starts to develop at about 15 months of age, is typically fully formed by the age of 13. And then we work with that worldview for the duration of our life. A worldview is one of those things when you say it, uh, I typically get one or two reactions, either a yawn or an eye roll. And, and that's because people think, oh gosh, this is another ivory tower lecture. This is one of those highfalutin $10 words that has nothing to do with my life. No, actually another way of thinking of worldview is it's your philosophy of life. Everybody has to have that to make choices. And that's exactly what a worldview is. It's your intellectual, spiritual, and emotional filter that helps you to experience, interpret, and respond to the world. It helps you to make sense of reality and figure out who you want to be, how you want to respond to that reality. What is your place within the world? How are people going to know you? And so it's your worldview that propels you forward. A worldview essentially is a combination of beliefs and values and attitudes that result in behavior. And keep in mind, we do what we believe. And so our worldview is the thing that determines our behavior. If you don't like the way things are going in your life, go back to your worldview, figure out why you're making those choices. You don't like the way things are going in the country, look at our corporate worldview and try to figure out how do we shift that. Now, when we talk about a biblical worldview, that's even more important. Because what that means is that as we form those beliefs and attitudes and values, they take shape based on our understanding of biblical principles. We go back to God's word and try to figure out how does he want me to live? How does he want me to think? How does he want me to behave? And that begins to form our worldview so that all the choices we make are in harmony with the very principles that he gave us for living. How many of you would say that things are kind of getting a little worse here in America, morally and spiritually and so forth? We're watching this. And that's because we're moving away from biblical worldview. And friends, this is nothing new. Moses, as he got to the end of his run, and was taking a look at what's the mark he wants to leave, what is it that he wants to say to the people, listen to what he says to them. It's like he's, he's back then, he was saying the same things. He was saying, these are the commands, decrees, and laws. The Lord your God has directed me to teach you to observe in the, in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. These are being given to you so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live, by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. So hear, O Israel, 
Hear, O pathway, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. So hear, O pathway. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one true God. There's only one true worldview. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children by talking about this with them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Write it. Write these things on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of people around you. Friends, for me, that's it. When Ron Ron gave me this message, I thought, that's what I've got to preach. That's what I've got to teach. That's what I've got to share. That's the indelible mark that I want to drive me for the next 10 years. I want everyone to love the Lord with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. And I want everyone to have a biblical worldview, friends, where we are living our lives with this as the lenses through which what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not true, how we live our lives. You don't come to me and say, Mark, what should I do here? And I say, well, I think you should do this. Then I'm just another person and I'm a sinner that falls short and I'm probably going to give you bad advice. But if we go to this, this will never fail us. This is what we have to be turning to. And why is it? Deuteronomy 6 tells you. There's two pretty good reasons why we should be a people that live according to a biblical worldview. First reason is so that it may go well with you. Who here likes the sounds of that? Okay, there's five of you. Great. I guess the rest of you want it to go miserable. Good for you then. (laughs) Friends, it's so that it may go well with you. And that word well does not mean easy. He's not promising that life will go easy. But what he is saying is that even when it's not easy, it can be well. You can have wellness personally. You can be well as a family. You can have a marriage that is well. You can have kids that are well. We saw that with the Bridges family. And this is also so that you, your children and children's children, may enjoy long life. And realize, when he is saying long life, what does that mean? Does that mean so that you can enjoy 80 years here on earth? Long life in God's economy is what? Eternal life. Who here does not want death to be the end for you, your children, or your children's children? Friends, this is kind of a big deal. This is about eternal life. So I have a question for you. Friends here at Pathway this morning, this is the question that I have for you. Do you want your children and grandchildren to have a biblical worldview whereby they love the Lord? They love his word. They love his ways with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Is that your end game? What was it for Mama Bridges? I'm going to call her Mama Bridges all the way through this. Did she want this for her children? Did she want this for her children's children? Is there anything more important than that? This is about eternal life. So now the question becomes, how? How do we do this? Because we're living in a world that's not going to teach biblical worldview. Can I get a big amen to that? So how do we instill this biblical worldview on the future generations? Well, both Moses and Mama Bridges both told us and showed us. First step is that you must be, you as parents and grandparents, must be the primary influence. Who was the primary influence in that Bridges family? Mama Bridges. Did you know that mom and dad are two to three times more influential than any church program when it comes to passing on faith to the next generations? Now, this church, Pathway, has some of the greatest children's programs and youth programs in the nation. You are so blessed. 
But if you think outsourcing it to the professionals is going to be what leads your children and children's children to have faith in Christ, those programs have about a 25% chance of working. Of course, they don't put that into brochures. But guess who has an over 80% chance? You. The influence of what mom and dad do, the influence of what mom and dad say, the influence of what mom and dad believe, it starts with you. So the question now becomes, are you, do you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength? What would your kids say? What would your grandkids say? But now let's get a little more personal. Do you have a biblical worldview? What would your kids say? What would your grandkids say? The reason George has taken this on and that I and Faith at Home, we have partnered together on this to really make this, this is what we want to focus on for the next 10 years, is because of this. Here's reality. There are a lot of people that say they have a biblical worldview, but saying you have it and really having it are two different things. George developed a survey that asked a bunch of questions to determine questions on things like, do you believe the Bible is true and reliable? Do you believe it's the authentic word of God? Do you believe Jesus is the one and only son of God? Do you believe in creation versus evolution? Do you believe in all of these are biblical worldview things? A biblical worldview of marriage, a biblical worldview. What do you believe? And here's sadly what has happened. Is he has discovered that there are a lot of people out there that say they have a biblical worldview and yet they do not. And that is creating mass confusion for our children and our children's children. Here are some of the stats that he has discovered. 80% of born-again Christians claim they have a biblical worldview, but only 19% actually do. 74% of conservatives claim to have a biblical worldview, but only 16% do. So then as a result, the next generation, the, the millennials, now only 44% of them, ages 25 to 40, say they have a biblical worldview, but really only 4% do. Because they're being raised in environments where it's been a hypocritical environment where we say we have a worldview, but we don't really. And so now less of them have it. 69% of adults who attend mainline churches, whether it be Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopal, claim they have a biblical worldview, but only 8% do. And 81% of people who attend my church, the Log Church, and Pathway, who attend evangelical churches like this, claim they have a biblical worldview but only 21% actually do. How many here say those are some pretty sobering statistics? And then we wonder why Christianity is declining in America. And what is biblical worldview being replaced with? It's being replaced with what is called syncretism. Syncretism is simply this. It's a blending of ideas, applications from a variety of holistic worldviews into a unique or personal but inconsistent combination that represents personal preferences. So it's like, okay, I, some of my worldview, yep, is shaped by this, but then there's some of this, uh, well, you know, that's a little old school, that's a little old fashioned, okay, I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of this, but I also am a little bit of this, and I'm a little bit of what culture says, I'm a little bit of what they say, I kind of like a little bit of what Oprah says, I kind of like a little bit of this, I kind of like a little bit of this, and that makes, that's my worldview. You know what I liken this to? How many of you have ever gone into a gas station where they have the fountain pop? And you grab your glass, and normally you go up and just get a Diet Coke. Or you get whatever's your favorite, a Mountain Dew or whatever. But have you ever seen your kids do this? Where they walk up and go, a little Diet Coke, a little Mountain Dew, a little 7-Up, a little bit of root beer, a little bit of right? They do that. What is that called when they make that? What is that called? Syncretism. That's what that's called. <laughs> but otherwise known as, what is syncretism? Suicide. Friends, that's Suicide. Trying to bring in all these different views will not lead so that it will go well with you. That is not going to lead to what we are looking for, friends. We are going to have to fight against that. And yet that is what culture is leading towards. That is what the schools are teaching. That is what's happening out there. And we can throw up our arms and say there's nothing we can do about this, but that is not true. Did you see what the Bridges family did to defeat that? So that sets up the second thing. God has given us a place that can influence where biblical worldview is formed. And what is that place? Our homes. 
Friends, what happens in the home is more influential than school. Because we can combat what hap- what's happening at school by talking about it at home. Did you hear where the Bridges family, where their worldview was talked about? Did they talk about, that we only do it at church? What did they do the second they got home from church? They talked about it. Talk about these things when you sit at home. When you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Impress, that's what you do. You impress the ways of God on your children by talking about it at home. And the home can be an apartment. The home can be a dorm room. The home can be a house. The home can be whatever it is, a condo. But those places, the home is more influential. And in God's design, we can sit here and say, oh, I wish the schools would do this. Oh, I I wish this. I wish they would teach it. I wish they would teach it. God didn't design for the schools to teach it. He designed for the home. He made the home the primary place with a purpose. Because he knows that that is the primary place. And then he even gives us four opportunities every day. Where we can talk about God, his words, and his ways. We can instill biblical worldview at home. Did you hear the four times? And we have them. They happen every day. That you can talk about it at home. He says, talk about these things when you sit at home. What is one of the few times where you actually sit down together at home? It's during what? Mealtime. And did you hear the Bridges family? When did they talk about? Well, they were eating together. Mealtime. You can talk about God's word. As we walk along the road, or in today's context, that's car time. They talked about, we, also, we talked about God, and we talked about sermons as we were riding home. We talk about God when you lie down, which is bedtime. And we talk about God and his ways when you get up. I want to give you a little hint on this one. How many of you are morning people? I don't like you. How many of you are not morning people? Yeah, we're much closer to God. But anyway, um, <laughs> friends, I want to give you a little tip. You have kids, and some of your kids are morning people, and some of them are not. If you have a child that is not a morning person, like me and my sister, my mom never tried to talk to us in the morning, and that was a beautiful thing. Because she knew it would not go well if she tried to do faith talk in the morning. But my other sister loved the morning, and they did their faith talk in the morning. But my mom would start talking about God, praying with me. She would do that at night because she knew I was a night owl, and I was just looking for a reason to stay up later anyway. Friends, let's take advantage of these opportunities God gives us every day. The video showed us a perfect example. A single mom made her home the primary place where her kids watched her live in love with God. She was just doing it on her own. But then she said, okay, in order for this to be instilled, I've got to talk about it with my kids. And i got to do it. We'll just do it at mealtime. We'll do it at this. And I'll do Bible study with the kids. I'll do everything with them. And how did it turn out for her? How did it turn out for her children and children's children? This is so that it may go well with you. Friends, that's the mark now. That's it. That's what Faith at Home Ministries has decided. That's all we're going to do now. We used to be a seed casting ministry, traveling to all different countries, talking to people about Faith at Home, and then leaving and going to the next place, and then leaving and going to the next place. And we were casting seeds. There's something about a parable that talks about when you cast seeds. What happens? Some of them take root, but the majority get squashed out. As a result of the pandemic, we've said... We now want to be a ministry that moves the needle. I don't like where biblical worldview is going. We want to see, I don't like what's happening. We want to see Christianity on fire in America. We want to see it growing in America. And it comes down to biblical worldview being taught in a home. So now all Faith at Home does is we work with churches who want to go be serious about doing that. And then we will help them assess where their current reality is. And then we will help them address it by putting together strategies to address their reality. And then they will go to work and it will come back every two years and reassess and readdress and reassess and readdress. And guess who is one of the churches that is our model church for how to do it well? This church. Pathway does things different. And this church, you are sitting in a church that has committed themselves to biblical worldview being taught through the home. And one of the things you are going to run into is whenever, throughout the stages of life, this church is going to be constantly bombarding you with tools and resources so that you can pass on the faith to your own children and children's children at home. How many say amen to that? And then our role is to come alongside. But I want to be clear. If this just turns into a church program, it ain't going to work. 
The church is not a program. The church is a people. If this is going to be a faith at home church, or as they call it, a life at home church, where we are leaving an indelible mark of a biblical worldview on our children and children's children, friends, and you need to understand it starts with you. It starts with you. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength? Do you have a biblical worldview? And I'm guessing there's a lot of you are like, I don't know if I do or don't. Great. Now's the time. Partner with this church and start growing. There's nothing better than when our kids can watch us grow right in front of them and watch our worldview change and watch it evolve and see it develop. They're seeing it as something that's real. So it starts with you. It starts with your worldview. And it starts with what you do in your home. And I'm going to leave you with this. Then there was another guy that was ending his career. His name was Joshua. And guess what Mark was that he wanted to leave? He looked at the people and said, as for me and my house, we know there are choices as to whether we live according to this or whether you live according to the ways of the world. And there are a lot of other gods you can serve and there are a lot of other worldviews. And what Joshua then said to the people is, we've made our choice. As for me and my house, this is it. This is what we're going to stand on. This is going to be our foundation. This is what we're going to live by. This is going to be our source of truth. This is it. Hey, how are you? And then he asked the people, what are you going to do? Pathway, what are you going to do? Today's message is for you. You may not have been living to, according to a worldview up to this point. doesn't matter. You can start today. Amen? We serve a God of second chances. Who says praise the Lord for that? Friends, let's start this today. And he told the people, and the people said, we're in. We're going to do this. And he's like, I'm not sure you really are. So he pushed back. But they said, no, we are really in. And he said, well, then here's what I want you to do. We're going to take this rock. We're going to put it up here. And whenever we come here to worship, whenever we see that huge rock, it's going to remind us that we made a commitment to be a, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord household. So that we never lose sight of this. So here's your homework assignment. This wouldn't be a faith at home message if it wasn't, didn't have a homework assignment. Friends, I want you to go home and get a rock. And I want it to be a big rock, an obnoxious rock, not a little pebble. I want you to go find a rock, a big rock, and then I want you to put it somewhere obnoxious in your home. Some place where you will always see it, maybe like in the middle of your kitchen table. And then people are going to be like, why do you have a rock in the middle of your kitchen table? And then I want you to take your Bible and I want you to set it right next to that rock. So that every time you see it, you can say it's because. Why do you have a rock and a Bible in your dorm room? Because I've decided as a student, a college student, he's going to be my foundation. The Word of God is going to be my foundation. Why do you have a rock and a Bible as a young couple in your apartment? This is our foundation. Why do we have this as a family? Grandma, Grandpa, why do you have a rock and a... Bible. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And all God's people said, Dear Lord, this is a defining and dividing time for us. But it's not like that hasn't happened before. For the people of Israel, it was a defining and dividing time. And you laid out what they needed to do. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. Pass this on to your children and children's children by talking about it with them. It was a defining time when Joshua spoke to the people. And friends, it's a defining time. Lord, it's a defining time now in our country where we have a choice. Are we going to stand firm on your word and your ways? So I pray for the people of Pathway that they will take this message and realize today's a day where they make a stand and choose. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, can we thank Mark for this morning? We're going to let all the life group leaders exit. So if you're a life group leader, go ahead and exit right now, part of that. And then uh, let's stand together. Hey, uh, again, Connect Sunday, as you head out to the lobby, uh, actually out to the the little patio area, there's some some drinks out there, some things for you to hang out with, talk to some leaders. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about work. And uh, I'm really excited about next week and what's that going to look like for us in a very practical way. And uh, have a great week, everyone. We'll see you later.